want to follow up from uh, last Sunday, if you were here, uh, and let you know that uh, we are now on a seven-day streak of not forgetting Adeline anywhere. Uh, Our previous record was 4,368 days. We're hoping to beat that uh, this go-around. And and I also want you to know and make this crystal clear that my wife had nothing to do with this, all right? This was all my fault. And so if I indicated last week that she may have been complicit in it somehow, she was not. I forgot to tell her. And then, as typical, she went and cleaned up my mess. And so thank you, babe. Uh, She's up there running the screen stuff today, so I just wanted to make that very clear for everybody. Yeah, give her a hand. Love you. So growing up, I used to love to play with Legos. Uh, Maybe you did too. Maybe you enjoyed playing with Legos with uh, with your kids, with your grandkids. Got a hand up there. And uh, and I, I... when, when, you know, kind of my age in the 80s and the early 90s, uh, playing with Legos, it was very different than today. You know, now it's like they sell these boxes and, and it comes like with these Lego kits and you have uh, detailed, you know, full color pictures and instructions on what to do that's like an inch thick and, and you kind of follow stage by stage and you build the thing eventually that is on the box. But, but when I got Legos, it was just like, here's a bag of Legos, figure it out. Like, use your imagination. And I love to use my imagination to create things. And, and so I had this, this tin of, of filled with Legos. It was one of those tins that you would get popcorn in, you know, the, the three things of popcorn that had buttered popcorn and cheddar popcorn and caramel popcorn. And we ate all the popcorn, cleaned it out, and repurposed it as my Lego bin. And so when I wanted to play with Legos, I would go into the dismay of my parents, you know, throw that on the floor and just start building stuff. And and if you've ever played with Legos that way, you know that there is a solution to any problem that you might face. If you get to a place where you are stuck and you don't know what to do, all you have to do is just start rummaging through the bin and you're going to find a solution you're going to find more Legos that you can put onto this thing that you are creating to solve any problem that you might face. And so if we built a bridge that was a little bit wonky, a little bit lopsided like this, you would do probably what I would do. I would turn back around and I would look for another Lego to come and add to it. There's a professor of engineering at the University of Virginia. His name is um, Lighty Klotz. And, and Lighty was, was playing Legos one day with his preschool son, and they built a bridge. I mean, actually, it's this bridge. It's exactly like this. And they got to this place where they had run out of bricks, and, and so they had an uneven bridge. And, and as Lighty was turning around to grab another block, his son just grabbed the bridge and took one off. And problem solved. And again, professor of engineering. I mean, if you know an engineer, they always overcomplicate things, right? And if you're an engineer, I know many of you, you know it's true. And so Lydia was like, oh, I got to get another bridge. We got to keep building on to it. And his son was like, well, we can just take one off. And it, and it triggered something in his mind. He's like, I wonder how often we do this. And, and so he started a research project. He pulled some other scientists together, and, and they were doing uh, little experiments to see what people would do when they were faced with a problem. And, and so he put experiments out like the lopsided bridge, just like that, and they would say, okay, do something to fix it. And, and then the, the problems would maybe get a little bit more and a little bit more complicated. And, and in every single one of the experiments that Lighty did, the most simple solution was to remove something. But do you know what 88% of the people did? They added something. And sometimes they would add multiple things when the solution was, no, just remove one thing. And their conclusion to this uh, experiment was that as a people, our tendency is to add more to solve a problem instead of thinking about how can we remove something? How can we take something away? That, That our tendency is to think, what do I need to add instead of what do I need to remove? 
looked at it through another lens and maybe stated just a little bit differently. When we face problems in our life, our tendency, my tendency, is to ask, what do I need to do? (laughs) Not, what do I need to stop doing? And here's what's true for me, and I have a feeling it's, it's true for many of you. When it comes to our life, it's a little bit more complicated than a lopsided Lego bridge. <laughs> the, the problems that we face have a little bit more consequences than that, but I, but I think it's, it's true. We, we, we approach the problems in our life by trying to add more to it to balance it out. Our, our problem, though, in our lives is that we are on a constant search for significance, and that's a little bit more meaningful than correcting a lopsided bridge. We are on this constant search for significance. Whether we know it or not, we are always asking ourselves the question and evaluating the answer, do I matter? Does what I do matter? Does the life that I live, is it adding value to anyone or anything else? Do other people think I matter? And we are constantly evaluating and asking ourselves these questions, oftentimes subconsciously. And for many of us, our response to these questions and the solution to this problem of do I matter is I need to do as much as I can to prove that I matter. That we need to do as much as we can to prove that we matter, to prove to myself and to prove to you that I matter. And so we think that if we can just fill our calendars with work and events, then we must matter because look at all that I have to do. I'm, I'm way too busy. I've, I've just I've got a lot going on right now. Uh, man, life is packed. Work is packed. We say that and it's almost, we, we wear it almost a little bit like a badge of honor if we're honest Because have you ever had to say to somebody, yeah, I don't really have a lot going on right now. They look at you like, oh, really? (laughs) If I can rise up the ranks at work, then we must matter because then look at all that I am responsible for. If I can just acquire more stuff, then I must matter because look at all I have. If I'm involved in really good things, then I must matter because look at what I'm giving my life to. If I say yes to everything, then I must matter because look at all these people that want a piece of my time. I'm important. In our search for significance, our tendency, my my first tendency is to add more to it, to try to find that value and that worth. And, And it seems like the more that we add into our lives and into our calendars, the further away we get from from what we actually desire in our life. And the danger of it is this, if you define who you are, meaning if you find your meaning and your significance, if you define who you are by what you do, then you won't know who you are when you have nothing to do. It's something a lot of people experience when they enter into retirement. It's, I think, what keeps a lot of us from, from resting sometimes. <laughs> we wonder, am I actually making a valuable contribution to this life, this world, my family, if I just sit and rest for a little bit? We wonder, if I stop, will I still matter? Am I still significant? Am I going to miss out on something? Are my kids going to miss out on something? And then we add to that, and we, and we have a culture that, that is predisposed just to say, here's all the Legos. Add as much as you can to it. Tech advancements means that we are always accessible, which just feeds that voice inside of us that says, you know, people need you. You're kind of a big deal. Most of us have never really learned how to put up boundaries around ourselves or around our times, and so, and so we have unhealthy relationships with people. I think all of us have a general sense of FOMO, like we don't want to miss out on anything. We don't want our kids to miss out. We don't want our grandkids to miss out, and so we just keep on adding more and more and more to try to balance out the bridge. And what's interesting in, in Lighty's experiments, 
is, is that they found that when faced with a challenge like this and, and other more complicated ones, 88% of adults would solve the problem by adding more. And sometimes adding multiple things, sometimes even having to pay 10 cents for one of the blocks that they would add. <laughs> until they walked into the room, and they gave no parameters around how to make it stable, until they walked into the room later and they said, oh, hey, just a reminder, you can also remove something. And it was like a light bulb came on in their minds. I hadn't thought about that. And all of a sudden, that number switched. So 88% of the people would do the simplest thing, which was just to remove something instead of add more. It's almost like we need a reminder in our lives that you don't have to add more. You don't have to keep pushing. You don't have to keep going. It is okay to stop. It is okay to rest. And it's almost like God knows this about us, right? <laughs> I think it's one of the reasons why he created these rhythms of rest that we see throughout Scripture. And God has given us these reminders that, that it is okay, almost like permission, it is okay to stop and say no. Rhythms of rest remind us that it is okay to stop doing and just be. In fact, I think that's why God gave them to us. If our, if our problem is that we're on this constant search for significance and, and our solution is just to add more to it, God's solution is, is to say, no, you matter, not because of what you do, but because of who you are. His solution is to find our value and our worth in him above anything else, to rest in the belief that you are a dearly loved child of God. And I think it's interesting that in Scripture, the, the first kind of space that we see God invite us into, humanity into, that first space that God invites us into is a time of rest. We, we read at the end of Genesis chapter 1, if you have a Bible, you can turn there. Um, we'll have the words up on the screen. Genesis chapter 1. That, that God goes through these rhythms of, and, and he's creating and, 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 we, we, and we see that he gets to, you know, through all of these different periods called days and he, and he gets to the sixth day and he creates us. He creates humanity. And he, and he creates us in his image and he gives us dominion and authority over the earth, meaning that we are going to take what God has started in creation and we're going to continue Continue it now. We're going to continue that work of making and beautifying and creating that God started. But before he sends us out to do something, he says, no, just be with me. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 31, this is what we read. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. And by the seventh day, God had finished the work that he had been doing. And so on the seventh day, he rested from all he, his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it, he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. That word rested in Hebrew, it is, it is the word Shabbat. It's a word that means to cease, to stop God ceased, he stopped, it is a day of rest, it's, it's where we get our word for Sabbath, and we see the value of Sabbath rooted right here in the beginning of creation. God creates us, and then he stopped to delight in us, and for us to delight in him. Meaning that before Adam and Eve ever did a single thing, God delighted in them. To me, it is a reminder that this is who you are. You are dearly loved and lovable. Don't miss that last part. Sometimes I think we hear, you are dearly loved, and it's like, oh, well, that's nice. 
you are lovable. You are worthy of being loved. I know a lot of us don't feel that way. But when we rest with God, he reminds us, no, you are loved and you are lovable and it is not because of anything you have done. It is just because of who you are. I've baked it into you. In our constant search for significance ends when we know that our value is in the Lord. We are dearly loved for and cared by him. It it, it reminds me of, 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 of parents marveling over their newborn children. You do not have to earn his love or your significance. It is already deeply established in who you are. When our girls were born, you experience this with your own kids, your own grandkids. We would just be holding them and, and rocking them. And I could just like stay there forever just looking at them. And, and they hadn't done a thing. In fact, oftentimes they would do things that would make us not necessarily look at them and marvel over them. <laughs> but we did. And it didn't matter how many dishes we had to do. It didn't matter if the yard need mode. It didn't matter what was on my calendar. I just wanted to stay in that moment and prioritize that above anything else. And, and, and you know what? Nobody ever asked the parents of a newborn baby, why do you love that kid so much? It's never done a thing for you. <laughs> and yet as we grow older, we begin to think that that's how we can be loved, right? That if I'm going to be loved, then I've got to do this. I've got to do more. And we take that and we project it onto God that if God's going to love me, then I have to do more and do more and try harder. And we just, we wear ourselves out trying to earn something that we already have. And all the while, God just wants us to enjoy the rhythms and the rest that he has invited us into. He knows that our search for significance ends when we find it in him. Rejoice in who he is and what he has done for us. These rhythms of rest remind us that it is okay to stop doing and just be. And these rhythms of rest, I mean, there's more than just the Sabbath. We see it multiple places, multiple ways throughout scripture. And so yes, one day a week, that Sabbath day, prioritize, set it apart, make it holy. We're going to talk about that. But, but then we also see, even within the creation poem of Genesis 1, each section ends with this refrain. There was evening, there was morning the first day. There was evening, there was morning the second day. And, and, and Jewish days, are, 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 they don't start in the morning, they start in the evening, as if to say, your day does not begin with production, it begins with rest, meaning your value does not begin with your production. Rest. There were annual feasts and festivals that were times of celebration and worship. People from all over would stop their work, sometimes for days on end, and come together and celebrate. Take extended times of rest and celebration with family. There were special days and ceremonies that God would set aside for his people to reflect and repent and renew their commitment to him as their first priority. And these annual days and weeks and festivals, they served as regular reminders to slow down, to take things off your plate, to remember who you are and whose you are. There was another time of rest for the the Israelites that God invited them to do. And it wasn't for them, it was actually for their land. It's found in Genesis chapter, or uh, Exodus chapter 23, verse 10. It says this, for, the, for, for six years you are to sow your fields and harvest the crops, but during the seventh year let the land lie unplowed and unused. And so every seventh year, even though there was work to do, even though uh, there, was, there was crops to grow and the land could produce it, every seventh year they were to just let the land lie, not plant not reap, not harvest, not plow, not do any of that. Let the re- land rest and, and rejuvenate. And, and it was a reminder that, that, yeah, even when there's work still to be done, you can rest. You can trust in me. And, and this concept uh, of, is, is called um, sabbatical. 
It's that seventh year of rest, sabbatical. And, and the sabbatical has been taken and kind of pulled out from this context, and it's been applied as an extended time of rest um, in many different fields and, and professions in life, uh, including in ministry. And several years ago, long before my time here at Sherwood Oaks, our elders had the wisdom to prioritize Sabbath for our ministerial staff. And so every seventh year that we are a part of the Sherwood Oaks team, uh, we are invited to take a sabbatical. And it's hard to believe, uh, but I uh, have been, I'm, I will be celebrating my, uh, the end of my seventh year um, in, in June. And so I am almost to that point of being past due for a sabbatical, where I'm afraid, like, if I don't take it, they're not going to let me have it. And they're going to say, sorry, you missed it. Uh, seven more years before you can do it again. <laughs> And so I got to get it in. <laughs> and so uh, I'm going to be preaching next, uh, next week, uh, Sunday the, the 12th, and, uh, and then I'm going to go on my, on my sabbatical. And, and there's a couple of things that are hard for me to believe. Number one, it's hard to believe that I've been on staff for seven years at Sherwood Oaks. Three of those were down at our Bedford campus, and then uh, the last four um, here in, in, in this lead ministry role. Uh, and... Our, our elders, I, I've said it before, I joyfully submit to them because they are man, men of integrity who love the Lord, who love our church, um, love me, my family, our team. And they graciously said, you know, Sean, we, we understand um, what the last four years have been. Transitions are hard. <laughs> uh, COVID was hard, some other things. Um, and they also understand that the trend for pastoral burnout and dropout has actually been like not just steadily rising, but sharp incline over the last four years. And so they said, we want to make sure that, that you and your family are healthy and that you stay in the game here for a long time. And so what we usually give is a six-week sabbatical and our elders uh, blessed Amber and I with a 12-week sabbatical that's going to start next, next Sunday. Hey, man. <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm sharing this with you for, for a few reasons. I've, I've noticed in my seven years here, sabbaticals have often been like a secret that we keep. Like we don't really talk about them. And I, and I, kind, of, I kind of understand why. Uh, I, I know, very well aware, there are many of you who work a lot harder and a lot more demanding jobs than what, than what we do. And, and you don't get a sabbatical. Um, and so I think that we don't want to like flaunt that. And so we don't really talk about it very much. Uh, we just kind of let it happen so that it doesn't create these awkward moments or those conversations of, oh, you're getting a sabbatical? Must be nice. Uh, you know, those kind of things. <laughs> um, but I think it's a missed opportunity. And so I asked the elders, is it okay if I just invite church family into this? And they're like, absolutely. And so... Um, so I'm just going to ask you, and we're going to have some resources for you to be able to do this, but just pray for us over those 12 weeks while we're away. Continue to worship, continue to serve, continue to be a part of what God is doing here. And so I wanted to, I wanted to share that for that reason, just uh, to, yeah, ask you to, to pray for us while we were gone. But then number two, um, hopefully at some point over those 12 weeks, you would have like realized I was gone <laughs> and maybe thought, I wonder where Sean went. And maybe you heard secondhand, oh, well, he's on sabbatical. And that that might be taken as code for, oh, he's on a forced leave of absence. <laughs> because unfortunately, I mean, we've seen that happen. Um, and I just want you to know that's not the case. We've been planning my sabbatical for nine months, and so there's nothing that's happened. Um, and, and so I'm going to be away. It's all healthy. It's all planned for. Uh, we have been planning this for a while. Uh, People have asked, what are you going to do while you're away? And uh, whatever I want, <laughs> it's going to be great. <laughs> uh, we have an extended family vacation that we're going to take. I'm uh, going to go visit some people that I've long admired in ministry and just ask them, how did you do it? How did you, how did you make it through the long haul? Uh, I'm going to be able to hang out with my girls this summer. We might even get a pool pass. Like, the options are endless of things that we can do. And then I, I wouldn't... I wouldn't be stepping into this unless I was fully sure and confident that, man, things here are going to be fine. They're going to continue without me. 
Um, I value leading as a team, and we have an incredible team. Our executive ministers, Maggie Mobley, Jeremy Earl, they're going to rock it. We, we have things that, I mean, ministry is not going to slow down. It's not going to stop. They're going to continue. We've got a big fall coming up, and things are just going to keep going as, as normal. Got complete trust and confidence in them. Um, here, Sunday morning, uh, we've got some good uh, speakers lined up to come and share the word with you. I'm particularly excited and bummed that I'm going to miss it. In June, we're doing a series called Hoosiers, and I've invited some of my favorite Indiana preachers to come and share with you, and so you're going to be able to hear from some guys that uh, I've known for a while that I love and, and just admire, and there might even be some familiar faces in there as, as well. And, and, it's, and it's hard going into this season. I'm, I'm not concerned about being away. I'm not concerned about what's going to happen here. What I'm really, what's the hardest part of all of this for me is that I, I am having more fun in ministry during this season right now than I've ever had before. I feel more fulfilled, feel like I've got more energy than I've ever had before. And so it's kind of this weird thing where I'm like, oh, okay, I'm going into sabbatical, but like, I feel good, <laughs> I don't feel like I'm crawling to the finish line, and I think that's certainly a testimony to you all, to our church, to our team, to our elders. Um, But I got to share, I didn't share this last service, but when I stepped into the lead minister position four years ago, I thought, you know, I knew sabbatical was going to be coming up, and not that I was looking forward to it necessarily, but I thought, if I can get to sabbatical, then we just might have a shot of making this work. Because I don't know if you know it or not, but the track record for the guy following the guy is not always great. And oftentimes they get chewed up and spit out to get to the next guy that actually is able to take it from there. And I thank you, like from me to you, thank you for not chewing me up and spitting me out. (laughs) And thank you for being a church family that has loved me through this transition, has been hard, loved me through some awkward moments up here that have been hard. And it's because of you that I'm going into the sabbatical going, oh, I'm going to miss it. And coming out of it going, I can't wait for what's ahead. Um, so that's a little update on what's happening. Thank you, guys. And I, and I go into it, and, and I think that the, the thing that I'm wrestling with, again, it's what many of us wrestle with. It's why we don't rest well. It's because there's so much to do, and there's so much we want to do. And, and God's just been saying, yeah, there is, but trust me. Trust me in the unfinished work. And I think so often that's why we don't rest well, is because we have a hard time trusting God in the unfinished work. And that's why these rhythms are so important There will always be more to do. There will always be more to add. But God's saying, yeah, and trust me with it. The rhythms of rest, they remind us that there is only one God and we are not him. There is only one who holds the universe together and it's not me. There's only one who is the leader and the head of this church and I ain't him. And he's not going anywhere. In fact, when the author and the sustainer of life took on flesh and stepped into this world that he created, he showed us the value of rest. Jesus would often withdraw to quiet places. He would invite his friends to go in there with him, and they would push back, and they would say, yeah, but there's so much to do. And Jesus would be like, yeah, it'll be there when we get back. But we need this time to rest. And our natural tendency is to keep on adding more and adding more but, but here's my challenge to you. If, if your life feels a little bit unbalanced right now, instead of saying, oh, we got to add more, I, I just wonder if there is one block that you could remove over the next month. But one thing. It doesn't have to be big. One thing that you could remove. And if a month feels too long, then maybe over the next week. And if a week is too much, then like this afternoon, is there anything that you can say no to? (laughs) To just rest. To be. We're going to talk some practical ways about how we can do that in the next few weeks. But I want to go back to the main point of this series. And today, rhythms of rest remind us that it is okay to stop doing and just be. And if Jesus needed those moments, then we do too. 
We need moments to remember that we are dearly loved children of God, not for what we do, but because that's just who he has made us to be. And if we ever need a reminder of how much we are loved, we just have to look to the cross. Jesus established one more rhythm of rest in the New Testament that we participate in every week here at Sherwood Oaks, and it's communion. And communion is a chance for us to rest our busy minds and our anxious hearts and remember and celebrate that God demonstrated his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And so we take the bread and remember his body that was given for us and we drink the cup and we remember and we celebrate his blood that was shed to make us pure, to make us holy and to remind us of how deeply we are loved by the Father. And so we have stations all around the room here in a moment. I invite you to get up, grab one of those, go back, worship. If you need someone to pray with, we'll have people with lanyards around the room that would love to pray with you. But as we come into this moment, may it be a time for you to rest in the Lord and know that you are loved. Jesus, let it be in this moment now that our hearts rest with you. Amen. Thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, here's a playlist with more like it. Be sure to give us a thumbs up, click the subscribe button to see more videos from Sherwood Oaks. Also, if you have a friend or family member who may find this video useful, please click the share button below. Thanks again. Hope you have a great day.